right, I seem to have forgotten to put my name on there, but I, I'm Jason Gunthorpe. I co-maintained the RDMA subsystem with uh, Doug here in the front row. And uh, congratulations to all of you for completing the first day of plumbers, jet lag notwithstanding, and welcome to our session. So this is a long presentation that I'm going to skip some slides on because it got to be too long. The whole thing is on the materials part of the website, so you can download the rest if you want to take a look at some of the things. So I'm not here to explain what RDMA is in any detail. I've only given two slides to that topic. So if you, just so that everyone is kind of familiar, it's, it's, it's part of Drivers InfiniBand in the kernel, which we now call RDMA for historical reasons, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, it's, it's not as big as the GPU subsystem, for instance, that I was just in a, a, another session about, but it is, it, is, is, it is pretty sizable and is one of the larger subsystems that goes into the Linux kernel these days. And it's been around as a concept in, at least since the late 1990s and has gone through a number of rounds of standardization by different standards bodies and different technologies and different mixes and things. And today, uh, kind of the longest standing and most current are, would be InfiniBand, iWarp, and, and Rocky. Although there are lots of other things doing parts of RDMA or, or elements there, and which again is a different slide. Um, so Drivers and Infinity Band has become this home for all these things that are under the RDMA umbrella that actually have nothing to do with Infinity Band. Infinity Band was just the, the first thing that implemented something that looked like RDMA. And it's even getting broader than that. We're seeing people put anything to do with stateless networking offload into the RDMA directory, which is, which is starting to get a little confusing. So if, if none of you, if, if someone here has never heard of RDMA before, uh, this is kind of where it fits in the industry. It's, it's networking. Um, it's kind of like TCP in that it sits up high in the networking stack and it relies intensively on hardware offload. And generally speaking, if you're interested in zero copy data transfer or high network bandwidth or low latency, this is the kind of technology that you're going to be interested in using, uh, especially if you need something like TCP. So the general industry purpose for it is that bandwidth and latency that you can get if you bypass the kernel uh, for your high performance networking. So it's, you know, ever since I've been involved with it, since the very early 2000s, it's been somewhere between 5x and 10x bandwidth win over single stream TCP on the same system. And I think today it's closer to 5x, maybe when I started it was 10x. And these, these are numbers that are sufficiently large that if your application is, is Needing this kind of performance is worthwhile to go outside of the traditional Ethernet to get it. Um, and latency, just the same deal. Once you bypass the kernel, you eliminate all that syscall overhead and, and things just get multiples faster. And this is actually getting worse as we go along in time, it seems, the system calls. Sometimes, some, some years they get faster, some years they get slower. We're on kind of a slower year right now. And of course, um, size, you can have typical RDMA solutions are targeting data center scale things with tens to many, many tens of thousands of nodes uh, in a single network. So typical industry areas you'll see using this is, is HPC, which is your weather simulations, chemistry, that kind of stuff. Um, to give you a sense of scale, the top machine right now uh, for the HPC is a machine called Summit run by the Department of Energy. It has 2.5 million power PC cores and 10 megawatts of power. And I tried to contextualize this a little bit. And uh, the internet told me that Facebook is estimated to use 60 megawatts for their entire global data centers, at least maybe of a few years ago. So this one HPC computer is a sixth of a Facebook. Uh, the one that just got ordered, um, it's called Coral 2. It's estimated to be 20 to 30 megawatts for the single machine, and they bought three of them. So the DOE will be running a Facebook worth of computers in a couple of years, at least a few years old of Facebook, of course. But so this is, this is enormous scale. Um, and then we get into sort of our traditional enterprise stuff where it's databases, VM clustering, all kinds of things. Linux is very strong here, uh, but also Windows is, is extremely strong, particularly when it comes to um, things like SMB, runs over RDMA and Windows and, and everything. So it's, 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 it's a bright thing. And, Finally, our hyperscales, uh, they're a little more secretive about what they're doing, but I, I guess you can imagine. And I like RDMA in a way because it really does impact people's lives. My house is under that blue line. Um, so the calculation of the Hurricane Dorian track 
uh, allowed a lot of people who were in harm's way to make preparations, have enough food and gas to, to survive without um, services. And this was enabled by RDMA networks on high performance clusters run by NOAA and the Canadian Hurricane Forecasting Center and other things. So this, this is something that's important to the world. And, and there are many, many examples. I, I just choose that one because it's very personal for me. My family's fine, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to make this presentation mainly about the rest of the slides, which is what I see the relationship of the RDMA system, subsystem with the rest of the kernel kind of is and where, where we follow kernel convention really well and sometimes we're kind of, you know, maybe forging a new course, maybe it's a little different. Uh, but this is what I'm gonna spend the rest of the slides, you know, kind of quickly going over. So in, in, inside the kernel, we have an in-kernel API to access uh, the networking technology, and it's it's relatively straightforward. It's it's based on command queues and completion queues, which will be familiar to anyone that's programmed modern DMA hardware. It uses the DMA API. Uh, it's got kind of an odd thing where you have to DMA map to the local IOMU and then also DMA map to the, the NIC, the network controller, which is not something you usually see, but this, this why is there will become clearer as we go on. And inside the kernel now, there's lots and lots of pieces of the kernel using it. There's a ton of storage drivers, a couple of different networking drivers. Uh, it, it spreads everywhere. And I mean, even in the last talk you saw people, there were two slides that mentioned RDMA in a talk about kernel CI. And this has been my experience recently is that for some reason a lot of people are talking about it more in their own presentations for their own topics because it seems to be touching different areas. Like testing RDMA is important and complicated and needs real hardware. You can't do it in VMs, so a CI solution uh, is very, very relevant. And of course, it's got a very big and exciting user API that's uh, probably not unlike some of the other big subsystems like GPU. And because it's zero copy and because it removes the kernel from the networking path, it does all these weird things. DMA interrupts, user space security is, is provided by the hardware and we even have the driver in user space. So this is, this is starting to look more like GPU than it is um, a traditional net dev kind of driver system. And along those lines, we're seeing this crop up all across the kernel, these same kinds of concepts because it, it is necessary to do this if you want the highest performance out of your hardware. So GPU and RDMA were probably at the very leading edge of this. Uh, we're seeing a, these special AI drivers that I, I've seen get merged lately are, are also very similar. Um, people, someone was posting about making an accelerator framework to kind of bundle these together. VFIO is doing all, a lot of the same stuff, just on a very narrow, kind of very narrow focus. And I, I think I saw in the, just a few hours ago, the uh, IOMMU PCI track was talking all about this pass ID stuff for, for doing um, DMA to user space essentially is, is a good use for pass ID things. And overall, we're getting better, but we still have a big lack of real kernel support for this kind of subsystem. There's a lot of things that the subsystems that need these features do kind of just sort of go hackety hack and we run into trouble. And we've talked about some of the trouble before and we're still talking about it and it's not entirely solved yet. But So I think the first challenge with running a big subsystem like RDMA is, is the question of what belongs in your subsystem. I mean, some subsystems maybe are very clear, like if you have, for instance, an I2C subsystem, if it's not doing I2C, it probably doesn't belong. Uh, in this case, we have kind of a really general topic of offloaded hardware accelerated kernel bypass networking and we, we violate all of those topics in some of our drivers. We have examples of drivers that do not do hardware acceleration that drop to the kernel and do work in the kernel. We have you know, drivers that don't implement all of our APIs because the hardware doesn't support it. So you know, we've had the debate most recently uh, when merging the Amazon EFA driver about what constitutes an acceptable RDMA driver, and we've kind of come to some detente maybe, but uh, so far, everything has to do with networking. That's kind of an important part. If you're not doing networking, you're definitely not RDMA, I think. Um, but we've allowed people not to implement the kernel API. We've allowed people not to do the RDMA part, which is the direct data placement to user space. Uh, you can do indirect data placement to user space and still be considered RDMA. Uh, we have two drivers in that example, and we have a couple drivers that uh, use the kernel to do their offload even though they're not um, 
they're still RDMA. And we have two software drivers that don't have any hardware uploaded. They're completely implemented in software with kernel system calls, and we're still calling them RDMA because they implement the networking protocols like RWARP and InfiniBand. So it gets a little confusing, but I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, but then things get a little strange. So you start talking about hardware that's clearly RDMA hardware. It implements all the relevant standards, but then it does more. It's got extensions. It has all kinds of things which are not in the standard, were never even thought about when the standard was written because the standard was written in 1996 and doesn't, the word virtualization hadn't been invented yet. We didn't even have SMP really in a commodity sense. So let alone all the stateless offloads that NetDev does. So people have added extensions, tons and tons of extensions, uh, primarily driven by performance. People want to get the greatest performance out of their network that they can get. And as we've seen, that requires new things, always requires new things. NetDev is always inventing new offloads in hardware, and we have them all in RDMA too. So we have this concept of standard verbs and device-specific verbs they kind of live side by side. And the standard verbs are the things you can read about in the spec, and the device-specific ones you can talk about your talk to your device provider and learn about how they work and kind of run this weird parallel thing going so that we can allow people to innovate without necessarily having to attempt to standardize everything too early before it's really been baked. Uh, I, I, as far as I know, Arhim is kind of unique in this regard. Um, all the subsystems seem to have some struggles. Like um, Daniel was talking about uh, for GPU about his uh, way his display pipelines work, and he standardized some parts, and some parts not yet standardized, I assume. So we're kind of in the same boat. But it's been rare to see something get um, promoted to something that's standard. Most things have been staying in the device specific, and that seems to be the direction that we're going into. So to support this device specific stuff, it all leaks into user space. None of the device specific stuff is really accessible in the kernel. Uh, this is all user space, it turns out. So to expose your device specific stuff, people have invented all kinds of exciting ways to do it. And the user API is really, really big and really complicated. Uh, there's actually three different kinds, which I think the next slides are gonna talk about. And it's gigantic. And a lot of it follows the standard. The big, big parts of it follow the standard. So you can read the standard and learn about the user API and try and understand it. And then about another maybe third or fourth is just driver stuff, stuff to, be, to allow the user space part of the driver and the kernel part of the driver to talk to each other and do what that piece of hardware needs them to do. Um, so everything has been kind of aged here. It's, it's been a long road to get to where we are today. Uh, I, think, I think it was first merged about 15 years ago, 2005, 2004-ish right now. And a lot of things didn't exist. We didn't have user include UAPI. So people just put their user API in the normal kernel headers. And it was a big effort to, to get them out, and we haven't even got them all out yet. Uh, because the kernel headers couldn't be brought into user space, the user space had another copy of all this stuff that was just peculiar and different. Um, the user space got abandoned because, I don't know, because. Uh, and when people wanted to do the extensions I mentioned earlier, they couldn't fit them into the original user ABI, so they added another one, and that didn't quite work, so they added another one, and, 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 and. So 15 years later, we have this compatibility mess as well. And then, of course, people writing a driver aren't expecting to encounter user ABI in their driver. That's not normal in the kernel space, at least in Linux. Users, user ABI is usually in the core subsystem, so we often see people working on drivers that don't quite grasp that they're doing the user ABI stuff, and they kind of accidentally accidentally stumble into mistakes that they shouldn't, shouldn't be making, and we try and keep the lid on that, but it's very difficult, and we don't have enough reviewers. So here's a quick example of how some of our stuff evolved and how it seemed to just be very strange. In 2005, when this all got started, uh, the original patches for RDMA were done with IO control, like, like you would expect, to, to call up to the CERT kernel and get a response back. And at that time, Netlink was just kind of getting started, I think, and people were sort of of the opinion that IO control was not to be used, so you should use a write interface on a file descriptor. This is much better. What they really meant is you should use a write interface and then a read interface to get your answer back. That's not what RDMA did. It just did write. Uh, and then the kernel would copy, copy to user back to a pointer that the write had in it. And this, this somebody pointed out eventually was a really bad idea. 
<laughs> uh, really, really bad ideas to the point that Linus um, required, uh, well, he required that we disable our, our interface, our user interface, because of how incredibly insecure it was. So we compromised and we made it so that if you call fork or pass the file descriptor to another process that it's disabled. So you could use it in one process, but you couldn't use it in another, which contained the security problem. But this, is, this was an issue, so we had to develop a new interface. So then we had you know, version one, version two, and the version three that used IOCTO all existing concurrently and all covering a different portion of the user API. It was a complete, complete disaster. And now 2018, it finally all got fixed, and IOControl is the one user API to rule them all. I could give an entire presentation on this slide. I'm just going to put this slide up. Uh, if, you're, if you're kind of curious about this and you maybe have a use for this kind of stuff, come send me a note, come talk to me. Uh, our I.O. control interface was designed around the similar ideas to Netlink. So instead of using a struct, you have uh, an array of integers that describe a, a value, a variable size value, so you can build up a, a function call using parameters that are described in a very loose way so that you don't have problems if you want to add more or make them bigger or change the semantics. You have a lot of tools to manage compatibility going forward. And it's supported with some crazy, I didn't make this, but this crazy uh, macro language in the C preprocessor that's kind of reminiscent of what was done for trace points. So we describe it, it I don't know, it kind of reminds me of IDL, although I think that would be a naughty word in this crowd. Um, so yeah, yeah, like I said, I could, I could give an entire presentation of how that stuff works. It, I think it's turned out well if you have this kind of need where you have a lot of stuff in user space in the kernel that's, that needs to be structured, but it's inherently dynamic and it's, everybody's always changing it and drivers are changing it. It makes it much, much more difficult for drivers to commit a mistake that's serious and would go undetected because everything is summarized really cleanly. But so like the rest of the kernel, you know, we struggle with the concept of should things be a mid-layer where you're sitting between your function calls or should they be a toolbox where you call out to the driver and the driver constructs what it wants by calling back into the, the core code. Uh, we've got examples of both right now, and a lot of the newer stuff is moving toward this toolbox idea supported by the previous slide. The neat thing about the previous slide is that it lets the drivers declare their own functions in the, in the, the IO control interface, which is really important if your drivers are providing extensions and, and other unique capability, which seems to be where we've come to in the design of our subsystem. Uh, but this usually brings the first reaction when you explain this to someone in a lot of details, you're like, well, what about security? You've now delegated a lot of decisions to the driver, the driver is talking directly to user space. How do you know that the driver is secure? And it's, it's actually worse in our case because not only do we have to worry if the driver is secure, we have to worry if the hardware behind the driver is secure because remember, RDMA is all about removing the kernel from the I.O. path. So my user space writes a command buffer in user space and my hardware DMAs that command buffer, the kernel, never touches the command buffer, it never gets in the way of that DMA, so there's no possibility for the kernel to provide security. Thus, we have a model where the hardware has to provide security to user space. Uh, and this is baked into the specifications. The InfiniBand specification was designed with this in mind, with like the full understanding of operating systems, and I think they did a pretty good job. So there's hardware objects for user space processes that contain their security and, and things make sense. It does require that every device essentially implement an IOMMU on the device, which is okay. It's still okay, but hopefully, um, you know, maybe we'll see that migrate to the, something like pass ID, so the IOMMU is only in the processor, but today it's in the device. And the devices generally do a pretty good job. Uh, things get a little more murky when you talk about Ethernet because Ethernet has a, um, a different security model and the Ethernet uh, piece of the specification was kind of bolted on toward the end. So our, mm, I call it sort of an unofficial standard expectation of an RDMA driver is that it respects all of the CapNet things that Ethernet defines. So if you're in user space and you don't have CapNet raw, you certainly can't form your own packets. You can form your own payloads, but you can't create your own headers can't use the broadcast after us, that kind of thing. This is proving to be a lot more difficult to enforce reliably as there's no real um, neutral standard describing all of these requirements and the people implementing the hardware don't seem to know about them. Uh, and this is, I'm not completely sure what to do about this as 
there doesn't seem to be a lot of industry energy to define these things at the standardization body since nobody's complaining. Um, but I think it does. And this slide, uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So in the classic sense, like a net dev driver is a, used to be a good example with things like AFXDP, it's moving away from this. But uh, in the classic kernel driver, if you read an operating system textbook, you'll see that the driver really just exists inside the kernel. It talks to the hardware and maybe the kernel provides an abstract POSIX API towards user space. And in no case does user space ever touch the hardware directly. It's, it's kept contained. The kernel provides virtualization and resource sharing and security. RDMA from day, day zero extended this model to say that part of our driver exists in user space and we do DMA directly between user space and hardware without kernel involvement. That was the entire point. And our latest generation of stuff in RDMA takes this even further and it puts part of what you typically consider to be the driver into the hardware itself. So we have a thin driver in the kernel that's, that's kind of just allowing user space and the hardware to communicate in a way to where it's able to enforce a security model. But we've delegated all of the security, a lot of the security stuff into the hardware and we've provided a way for the hardware to identify a user process. And it's kind of interesting. We, we already are doing this um, in the industry in, for virtualization, because now you often have one piece of hardware that's serving multiple VMs and the hardware is asked to provide security against the different VMs and partition them. This is kind of the logical extension. Instead of having one or two VMs, we can have thousands of processes and the hardware provides a boundary between them that's about as strong as the boundary between VMs. Um, so, so far, if you really, really care about security, you tend not to like this. But also we've seen that any time you have anything, you can have bugs that cause security impacts. I mean, last year saw the announcement that all of our CPUs are apparently insecure. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you want the performance, you end up having to rely on hardware to do security. We accept this in the CPU area. Our CPUs have IOMUs, they have ASIDs. It's all the same stuff. Now it's on the NIC instead of the CPU. If you trust your NIC, maybe you're okay. But it is very strange. It's very, very strange that that something on the other end of the PCI device is being asked to provide more security than just labeling its TLPs with the correct VDF. Um, however, we're very lucky. RDMA has a very robust set of standards that guide the security things. And as long as the hardware implementation follows the standards and dots all their I's and their conformance statements, then there's a good chance that it's, that it's at least architecturally correct. I even if it wasn't, who would find the bugs uh, is kind of where I get to because the drivers are very big, the hardware is very, very complicated. Um, but fundamentally, this is what separates RDMA from NetDev, is RDMA has accepted hardware offloaded networking, which means we've accepted there was another processor touching our packets than our own, and NetDev did not make that choice. Um, so this got mixed into containers this year. That was a big effort. Containers were exciting because the specifications from a million years ago didn't also didn't have the word container in them. They didn't have virtualization. They certainly didn't have container. So they, they had a little bit more of a difficult time. Uh, what, what ended up being the most successful answer is that to treat each container as a VM and the hardware, we have hardware that can already um, provide partitions between VMs that are very, very similar to the partition you want for a container. So, um, containers are about as strong as a VM in RDMA's world, at least for the implementations providing them. So this is when I see Dan over there and Ira over there. This is, this is close to their heart that uh, RDMA does DMA from user space. Hooray! And well, that doesn't work so good, it turns out, because you can make the kernel crash if you, if you breathe hard, apparently. Uh, you, don't do DM, you don't wanna do this to file back pages because you'll get into trouble. It doesn't work with DAX for a different set of reasons. There's gonna be uh, an entire session on Wednesday in the RDMA track on Wednesday morning talking about some of this stuff. Uh, there was a really successful session last year. I hope we can keep making progress here. Ira's got a really good proposal for leasing that might solve this finally. And we also wanna talk about zone device because my friend's doing GPUs. They, they wanna work with zone device pages and we can't RDMA to those either. And, and a perennial argument that I have with Kristoff Hellwig is that 
RDMA and GPU and pretty much everyone doing DMA to user space makes the assumption that the architecture is going to be DMA cache coherent so that we don't need something like the DMA API in the kernel. I can just, if I DMA to my page, then I can just turn around and read from that page right away and it's going to be okay. Uh, nobody, nobody that I've ever been aware of has tried to make something like the DMA API in user space that can flush the data cache of the processor at the right moment. And because we didn't even start out with that concept, the, there's tons and tons of library stack built on top of this thing that doesn't have a place to put the cache flushing. It's impossible. So what myself and the GPU maintainers have asked for in the past is can, can we just know that the architecture needs cache flushing and turn off our APIs? Um, that has not been popular. So you know, if you do it wrong, you get to keep all the pieces today, don't do it wrong. <laughs> Um, the other topic that also will be discussed uh, at length this um, Wednesday morning in the RDMA track is DMAing between devices. This is something that becomes very interesting for RDMA as it is essentially the fastest pipe into and out of your system. Um, pretty much, if you're going out of your system right now, you're probably going on an RDMA pipe and if you want to slosh data around your system and not have it touch system memory, you want to do something called peer-to-peer transfers on PCI. Uh, we now have support for that in the kernel between certain cases with NVMe devices and we'd very much like this to be extended to user space. So there's going to be an entire track on that. This is the diagram I made to talk about it on Wednesday. Come Wednesday if you want to know how this diagram works. I, I like it. It's got a nice symmetry. Uh, and of course DMA from user space again is, is one of the big challenges. It's now um, GPUs and RDMA have this ability to do paging, on-demand paging, we call it in the GPU world, or RDMA world, the GPU people tend to call it shared virtual memory or shared virtual address space or a whole bunch of other things. I think the IMMU call, people call it something else yet again, but this is the idea that I can have um, a page in system memory and I can page fault it. I can put it out on swap even though I'm DMAing to it. And when my DMA would like to access it again, my CPU takes a, essentially a page fault from DMA, indicating that I'd like to have that memory back. Um, very exciting. It makes the system very dynamic. We don't have to lock memory and uh, lock pages in memory to do network transfers for them. Everybody loves this, but it's also very difficult. So we're working with the HMM stuff to try and get HMM and RDMA and GPU using a similar set of kernel APIs to accomplish this. I think we'll talk about this a little bit more on, on Wednesday as well. But there's already systems shipping, like Power9 Cappy is already doing this uh, stuff with a hardware, hardware mediated IOMMU. And it's, it, seems, it seems to me like for a long time that's going to be the industry direction, but it's been a long time. So uh, maybe, the, maybe it'll take a while. So my last little part of the, the, this presentation is the challenges we have with NetDev. Um, as you can see, RDMA is networking and NetDev is networking. So why do we have two things in the kernel doing networking? Especially when, you know, this, this is my observation when I was making this slide here, uh, everything seems to end up on IP. I mean, today, we started out with NVMe, it's a great example. We had NVMe over PCIe and it made a lot of sense, everybody was happy. Then we put it over RDMA because you always want to access your storage over RDMA, I don't know why. It's very popular and people were mostly happy. So then we were running NVMe over RDMA over IP, okay. Now we have NVMe over TCP, so NVMe is even more directly over IP. And uh, some of my friends tell me that they're making computational NVMe, so they're gonna have Linux running on the NVMe drive. And I bet that we're this far away from running IP over NVMe over RDMA over IP. And that'll be fantastic. <laughs> Everything becomes RDMA and IP in the end. So why are they different when they're obviously so similar? And it's, it's because NetDev has taken the very strong and I think correct stand that NetDev is going to have full visibility. So there's, there are not so many offloads in NetLev that are stateful. Uh, they're, they're sort of eking into the stateful space a little bit more than they certainly were 10 years ago. But fundamentally, there is no TCP offload engine as it's been called in NetDev. Like you cannot terminate TCP on your networking card and feed it into a socket like you can in Windows. NetDev has said no to that. And they've said no to that for security and also because it doesn't interact with the net stack at all. You lose things like net filter, you lose things like BTF inspection of your packets because they never reach the CPU. For this reason, RDMA could never be part of NetDev. So 
So it ended up as a separate subsystem. And it's, it's really, I think, distinguished from NetDev is that RDMA should have some kind of stateful offload uh, where hardware has the option to implement some kind of operation entirely on hardware and packets can never see the CPU. But it gives us this weird tension where now that mm, RDMA is running over Ethernet, we're sharing the same physical wire. Often we're, saying, we're now also sharing the same MAC address and we're sharing the same IP address as NetDev because it's the same hardware in the end. Uh, it's kind of weird. If you go through the RDMA paths, you skip all the stuff I mentioned, bonding, NetDev, BPF, all of it gets skipped because RDMA goes right to the hardware. But it's using the same IP. Uh, this is something that would do better to be more formalized. But for now, this is just sort of how it works. Uh, iWarp got really messy. Not only did NetDev want, not want there to be any offload, didn't want RDMA to have offload either, so uh, they wouldn't allow iWarp to reserve port numbers because iWarp is integrated, I, IETF integrated with TCP when they designed the specification, so you need to reserve a port number for the hardware to use. And the NetDev compromise was that you could reserve the port number in user space, but not in the kernel. So iWarp has a daemon in user space where the RDMA stack goes to user space and says, hey, I need a port to run my TCP on, and that user space daemon seems to be responsible and everybody seems to have been happy with that. And of course we have NetDev running on top of RDMA. And in both cases it's been kind of an odd fit because IP over IP defines a new um, net neighbor discovery protocol. It has a different LL adder. Uh, so some of this was fit into NetDev and some of it was just kind of left as if that weird, is that weird user of NetDev that does things differently for address resolution. And you, know, you can find in the Git commits, you know, Dave Miller making commits to RDMA and they're like, that's so stupid. So <laughs> we try and keep it all together, but um, really the two technologies are going in different directions. But then we come to something like DPDK and they come back and they converge again. So uh, DPDK, for you who might not know, is called the Data Plane Development Kit and it is a user space library that you could imagine it, it uses VFIO to directly talk to the NIC and uh, obtain a lot of the things that I've been talking about here for UDP packets. It achieves zero copy, low latency, user space, you know, kernel bypass, uh, except this is again overlapping with RDMA and the, at least for Mellanox, the uh, DPDK driver, the PMD, is implemented on top of RDMA instead of VFIO. So we're using RDMA to provide Ethernet services to DPDK in user space with all the offloads and all the capabilities that you have in the kernel. So it kind of went full circle. We, even though we're taking a different path to get to the NIC, uh, it's still providing Ethernet because at the end of the day, it's, it's an Ethernet NIC. And this, this almost, I think, almost broke the whole RDMA model because when you say you want to do DPDK, it's immediately about ultra high performance. So everything matters, like the size of your cache line alignments and your, you want to access every strange feature that the NIC can do, every single stateless offload the NIC can do, and it doesn't fit with the traditional RDMA API. And then we're seeing even more where we're, we're having, I'm, I'm hearing people proposing VFIO MDEV is connected to RDMA, uh, which is going to become quite interesting. I'm waiting to see those patches. Um, but I see I, left 10 minutes for questions. 20 year anniversary for Mellanox and this will be the last time you hear their name at Plumbers, I think, so. Look, they had a big party, they sold the company. It's okay, to that guy. All right, questions, comments, tomatoes. Leon, in the red, please. Ooh, all right. So, <coughs> given all the complexity of RDMA, does it make sense to, I don't know, move to Ethernet side completely? Move to, sorry? To Ethernet, like make Ethernet fast. Yeah, so for example, one problem so we have to is uh, Melanox. If we have uh, one flow from one IP and uh, one port, uh, all the IO is uh, uh, basically bombing one uh, core. Okay. So if we would distribute, if, if we would have ability to distribute uh, this flow among, let's say, eight or 16 cores, uh, we'll be able to separate the link like 100 gigabit. So I mean, so we don't need uh, RDMA. 
to speed things up, we just need to, you know, uh, parallel processing on all cores we have. So the, there's a <laughs> distinction here. So the, most of the users who want RDNA care about like the TCP part of this, right? They, yes. And they, furthermore, they don't want to pay the cost of TCP because every single s clock cycle you spend doing TCP stuff on your supercomputer is a clock cycle that could have been spent thinking about hurricanes. Right, so, and it turns out that you can make dedicated hardware to do reliable messaging that uses a lot less power than if you do it with something like a Xeon. That's, that's kind of the fundamental use case. Yeah, so but then you have to pay uh, $3,000 uh, 3, versus like 600 you know? It's very cost sensitive. Uh, for the for the super, for the community that wants this stuff, yeah, it, you know they pay the cost because it gives the ROI. For for maybe what you're talking about, you're right. You could do it with uh, packet processing, and um, I'm not sure what your application is, but like DPDK does do per core pinning of raw Ethernet flows or even even higher level flows through the, the Mellanox PMD. So this is this is all already possible. I don't know a lot about Ethernet, so I can't really comment on that. Okay. Whoa, oh, we lost our mics. Is there food coming at me? Oh, sorry. I can only look at one thing at a time. Um, but, but the other issue, or the other thing to remember is that RDMA hardware actually is quite reliable and doesn't need to retry often. So a lot of these protocols are built on top of that. And so the underlying, because the underlying hardware is different, they get a lot of the performance. And yes, the hardware is more expensive, but they get that performance without ever having to do retries or things like that. So it's all about performance for these people. I, yeah, I understand. Um, you know, so, and, and that's part of the reason that things like Rocky exist, right? Well, right. It, it, and it, it, I, so, I think so I should qualify for So performance. it comes back to the point that Jason said is people running this stuff, they don't care about doing that in software at all. They don't need it. Right. And, and just to keep everyone in mind, the, the first slide when I said the top computer right now is 10 megawatts, the number, when we talk about performance, the number of people have really started to care about is not how fast your machine is, although it's important, it's how much power it draws. A 10 megawatt computer in a room that's probably about this big is a significant engineering challenge. Yes. No, wait, no, that one, sorry, that one was PowerPC. That one was PowerPC. The Coral 2 one that's going to be 20 or 30 will be Intel, apparently. That's what the news says, anyway. I have two questions. The first one, is your home uh, in Alabama? Sorry? <laughs> is your home in Alabama? The uh, Hurricane Dorian is, was Oh, no. Heading in that direction. No, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, that was a mis misreporting. Uh, and, uh, I live in Nova Scotia, so it's in Canada. It, yeah. You know, it went up, not, not <laughs> west. Use a Sharpie. Uh, the second one is, you mentioned about like a 10,000, uh, uh, is it 10,000 nodes, right? So when uh, I was talking the, about the, the sense the of the The largest network, supercomputer? Yeah, that, or, those numbers are a little bit harder to come by, but the... Um, you can talk about the number of cores, the number of sockets, and then the number of network endpoints, essentially. The number of nodes is, is usually how it's expressed. So um, 10,000 is, is probably a mid-sized computer at this point. Uh, okay. But there's all Maybe kinds of ratios. Maybe even more than that. So Jason, you're talking about network endpoints. Yeah, well, network cards, essentially. Right. Yeah. So That, that came well, out wrong, Ira, I, I think. I, I, yeah, okay. I think okay. that came out a little wrong, that but came out. I appreciate the message. Well, I've, I've recently changed jobs. So. But, uh, uh, right. In HPC, people refer to nodes as like the physical, ne usually network endpoint. Sometimes a node might have network, but that's not CPU. So nodes could have, you know, 88 CPUs or, you know, hundreds of CPUs. So... 10,000 network endpoints is like the size of the fabric or the size of the network. Is oh my goodness, uh, that's like an endlessly long question. So, yeah, so, I, it, I, so this I've is done presentations on that and <laughs> yes, that's a whole nother different so, story that has nothing to do with the kernel. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, th there's lots to of solutions, some extent, yeah. different solutions, but this is why it's not ethernet because ethernet doesn't solve that problem. 
at all, right. really, without a lot of extensions. So people said, I, I can't do that with Ethernet. I'm going to build my own stuff. There's all kinds of examples of their own stuff. Some have been more successful than others. Some have ended. Some have succeeded. But it's a very, very big, complicated question. And, and the Ethernet is, just wasn't built for this kind of stuff. Like, my favorite HPC network is the 11-dimensional hypercube that NASA runs. This means that their wiring was optimized for cable length because that's important in the, as part of their cost factor. What? Yeah. It's sort of right. No, 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 that, that's right, but that's not even the most net interesting network, but that's okay. Yeah. We, we can, we can you, debate that. You can have your own drinks. favorite. <laughs> okay. Any final questions? All right, thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jason.